Okay, go ahead. Thanks. Uh, let's call the meeting of the Finance and Operations Committee to order on November 24th. We're meeting, meeting virtually in accordance with the governor's executive order. We can dive right in with the 2020-21 financial report. Matt. Thank you, Lou. I'm going to start with the commentary, which is the Word document. Under the summary, the last bullet, our current reforecast is projected at $546,734 under budget. This is an increase from last month where we reported a projection of about $363,000. So we'll get into some of the detail where the additional savings is coming from. By major object, the first item salaries, we have potential savings of $300,000 due to lower cost new hires, uh, resignations and retirements. This is the same item that was reported in the prior periods. We just increased it from about 275,000. Under benefits, there is no change here. We still have the unbudgeted expenditures of 10K due to unemployment and 25.8 savings from HSA and anticipated employee education reimbursement. Again, those are unchanged from October. On the second page is where we get into a lot of the larger amounts. Other purchase services, we have unbudgeted expenditures of 507,000. We have the additional route for an uh, out of district technical school. Again, this was reported in the prior period. And we have an increase in district outplacement costs at private schools. And we also have an anticipated decrease in the state excess cost reimbursement. The excess costs, we're looking at a decrease of about $400,000 from the state. This is due to the number of students reported and also our threshold increase from the prior year. I think we're about $76,000 for Weathersfield. And then any amount over that would be reimbursed at anywhere from, we budgeted 72%, but we're unsure of what the state will actually reimburse us. For potential savings under other purchase services, we're looking at $738,000. And this is due to many factors. I'll, I'll go through the list here. We have eliminated two in-town special education transportation routes. That's about $50,000. We have one elementary school that did not require a special ed route this year. And then there was also a wheelchair lift vehicle that was budgeted that was not required. We have an anticipated decrease in out of district special ed transportation routes and costs. That's about $294,000. A lot of these outplacement facilities are in a hybrid model or have been in remote for a certain period. So we're not getting billed for days that there is no transportation. We have athletic savings for transportation. This was in the prior period as well, $30,000. And then there are no regular ed or special ed field trips, obviously due to the current situation. We have realized savings with the student accident insurance premium. This is related to athletics. It came in about $5,000 under budget. And then we have a net decrease of six students in district place public facilities, along with the decrease in the excess cost, which I previously mentioned. And I did send out to the committee the separate Excel sheet of special education facilities, uh, what we had budgeted and what our projection is for this year. We can go through that if you'd like, but that's where those numbers are driven from. So we're in better shape than the prior period. Um, I think we'll hold probably in the five to $600,000 range right now until there's something dramatic that happens, but we'll see what plays out over December. Any questions on the detail or the current year financials? Great, questions on that? We have this question every year. Why do these schools cost so much? Oh, the outplacement? Yeah. Well, it depends on the level of services that each student requires. I know. Yeah, we're no days are gone where the minimum cost was fifty thousand dollars. You're looking at a hundred to one hundred fifty thousand dollars, excluding transportation. Yeah, 
Any other questions on that budget? No. All right. Moving on to the 2021-22 budget timeline. The timeline for this year, I think we're going to be aligned with the, let's see, two years ago, where we had a draft in January. Last year, we hustled and had a draft ready for, I think, mid to late December. Unfortunately, we are contingent on the town closing out the prior year audit and then working with the financial software in order to create our new year budget entry and get into Munis. We're looking at the first week of December to start that process. We also had an insurance committee meeting last week and once the November claims close in mid-December, we'll have a better estimate of what the health insurance increase will be. Right now, the projection is about 5%, but again, we need one more month to close before we have a better understanding. So I think December will be focused on all budget entry, preparing a, a draft and then have that out maybe shortly after the holiday. Has the audit work within our district, has that been completed yet at this point by Bloom Shapiro? Yes, they're finalizing that. We have no findings, no issues, clean audit. Excellent, thank Great. you. Great. Matt, to go back to a last year's budget kind of, how mm -hmm. did we, how did the town use that 500, 600,000 that we had savings to pay off the insurance? What was the exact accounting we used on that? So the 625 from the 1920 budget was put into the town's health insurance fund. So that was essentially, they were using that as our 2021 contribution. So we reduced our 2021 budget for health insurance by that amount. Okay. And now how's that gonna affect us as we do budgeting for next year? So we're still gonna take the same approach where we look at our current employee roster as of November and determine who has coverage, what that type of coverage is, the cost, and then the estimated increase. When we do a year over year comparison, we're gonna to have to take our 2021 budget, add in the 625 as the baseline, and then look at what our 21-22 total amount is for the year over year increase. So are we behind the one, like 625 then in theory or? No, not at all. No, okay. No. But we're, we're definitely in a better position now. Chris Monroe from USI recommended the 5%. And I think once November claims close, I, I, we're not gonna jump up to 10%. Maybe we'll hit six, possibly 7% as a recommended increase, but that's much better than the 12 and a half percent we use for the current year. Okay. Lou, I have a question. Thank, thank you, Lou. So Matt, this is a financial and perhaps a um, policy question as well. So um, I know we had in Michael, a certain number of subs that we were gonna hire, try to hire, which was a significant increase uh, that we we're hoping for due to the needs of the pandemic. And I believe we haven't filled all those. So I don't know if there, there's money still allocated for that. I assume there is. And then the policy part of the question is I know some neighboring towns, uh, and this was in the press, uh, are looking at uh, hiring um, college students, uh, like central uh, students that are majoring in education, future teachers. And I know Newington is doing this and other towns, I don't know if we've looked into it or if we can look into it, but it, I would suggest it might be something worth looking into. So one is the budgetary question. I assume we haven't used up all that we allocated. And two is the kind of policy. Can we look into using maybe students at Central to fill uh, substitute needs? Well, I can answer the budget question. We, we are monitoring the substitute teacher line. And right now we're projected to be just at or below budget, but there are many variables involved at this point. We have to see how the rest of the year plays out. Last year, we had significant savings due to the extended closure. So if we get into a similar situation, we'll, we'll certainly have more funds available in the overall budget. And the piece, Kenny, with regard to uh, the college students coming back and working for us, we would certainly welcome that. 
at this point in time. Obviously for us, we utilize Kelly services. So um, we would look to work, either work them in through Kelly services or if the state has some additional protocol, um, we can utilize that protocol. But yeah, we're all in on that um, once we see what the specifics look like coming from the state and how many of our college students are actually going to come back and engage in this. Uh, the, the challenge with this, you know, when we talk about college students coming back, it's all fine and good until mid-January, but then their semester starts up again. And if they're at the undergraduate level, the reality for them is they're gonna have schedules. And how do I know this? Because I have a graduate student at home who I have already asked, this is how desperate we were last week at Hanmer. Uh, I already asked what her schedule was because she's currently a licensed SLPA, speech and language pathology assistant. And she's still in the midst of courses for another two weeks. Um, she is fully online. Um, so she wasn't able to come in, but uh, she being my daughter. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, so we're, we're looking for any opportunities um, from a perspective of the sub positions. We had seven building subs last year. We added an additional 16 positions. So we had multiple building subs for each building. Uh, the largest number of positions we filled out of those 23 were 14. And I don't think we're even at 14. I'd have to check with Trent because we've had some further attrition. What happens with these building subs in many cases is they will get a, especially if they're certified, they will get a long-term sub position that pays higher and pays with benefits in another district. So, and that's the other challenge. All districts are dealing with this and talking with my colleagues, the, the rush for subs and the closure of buildings in many cases, it's, it's procedural based on we just can't get subs, can't fill the positions. No, thank you, Michael. I understand it's a difficult uh, situation. Uh, it was both on the news, um, the TV news, as well as the print news, that central students are, and then one, one young man was being interviewed, are mm -hmm. being uh, used in local towns to fill a need. And I don't know if there's a way to reach out, if we haven't yet, but reach out to folks at Central, yep. uh, maybe in administration, about maybe getting some of those students who are education majors to fill in. And, and maybe we can convince your daughter. <laughs> Absolutely. She hears good things about the district. Yeah, she should know. Probably from her father. Yeah. <laughs> They're all true. Thank you, Lou. That's all. Yeah. So a couple more items on. Oh, go ahead, Jim. Go ahead, Jim. I had a question as to who initiates the audit and how long the audit generally takes. So the audit is a state requirement and the town handles the bid and the contract. I think, I don't know if they went out to bid or they just did a one year extension for the current audit. They do, the firm Bloom Shapiro out of West Hartford has been doing Weathersfield for many years. They typically do preliminary field work in the summertime, June, and then they do the final work in September and October. And then the state reports or the entire audit has to be issued before January 1st. Thank you. A couple more items on the 21-22 budget, just thinking about our outplacement tuition and transportation. We do have savings this year, but I'm going to caution against building the 21-22 budget based on those numbers. Most likely we'll have to look at the 1920 figures in some capacity. Again, we had the several months of closure, but we really don't want to short ourselves in the 21-22 budget. I hate to put in contingencies for outplacements, but we, we do have to determine what the best budget number is for tuition and transportation because we have two funky years here that we're not getting a, a full picture. And for salaries, we have three unions that are in negotiations. I believe WASA, the administrators, is settled or close to. There's a draft. And then with the secretaries and pairs and the nurses, those negotiations will not even begin until the springtime. So most likely we'll have to look at historical increases and just build in a percentage for all those employees. Great. Any other questions on the budget timeline? Great. Any other business? 
Lou, I know you bring up uh, the issue of pay to play. Uh, as you know, Mike Maltesi will be uh, presenting a piece on uh, athletics tonight. Right now, uh, we are in a holding pattern uh, with our winter sports until January 19th. So it's not a lot of additional information yet, but I know that's something that uh, was on your radar screen. And I just want to let you know that we will, uh, we will address that this year once we have some clarity on what's going on with winter sports. Great. Thank you. I'll just put it out there too. Everyone pass the word out to pick up free breakfast and lunch at the high school during the full remote or at any time too, because our numbers are down from last year. So let's get these students their free meals and some reimbursement to the districts. Michael, does a student still, at one point the student had to go that it didn't have to go. Does the student have to be there for pickup? No. Yeah, okay. student does not have to be there, Lou. And they, 18 and under, they do not, they need to be a Weathersfield resident, they do not need to attend a Weathersfield school. Okay. Matt, as we look at the next year's budget, is any of our services got to go out for bid? Are we current on busing in the food industry? Where are we on those? So, yeah, actually the food, the transportation is solid. This time next year, we'll start that process unless we decide to just grant extensions to the, the companies, but we can determine that in several months. With the food service program, we are required to go out to bid this year. The state is waiting on federal approval for a one-year waiver. So if that does come through, then we'll postpone until this time next year. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Matt, how about legal services? Yeah, legal services, we have not gone out to bid, but the rates have not increased from the prior contract. So I guess that one's kind of in limbo because both firms are still operating under the previous contract. So if they ever do increase, I guess that's when we can determine if we want to um, issue an amendment or go out to bid. Great. Anything else? I did, uh, Matt, I'm just finding it um, most challenging to th even think of a budget for 21-22 school year. Um, it, it, there's so many variables that are unknown. Yeah, it, it's tempting to, you know, reduce in certain areas just based on last year's savings and this year's projected savings, but we know that's skewed based on the situation. I can tell you right now, I'm asking for summer school, broad summer school, beyond just the extended school year. I want summer school, got to close the gap. So that's yeah. on the radar screen. Wow. Michael, right. are you thinking for the elementary ages for that or all I, levels? I'm thinking K-12. All levels. Okay. I'm thinking all levels, absolutely. From credit recovery for the high school, you know, we dabbled in that a little bit, not through credit recovery, but more of an enrichment with our uh, Edgenuity program. Uh, we did a, a program that was extraordinarily popular at the elementary level, and obviously our extended school year program for our students with special needs will be in place as well. But, you know, again, we want to close the gap. We're well aware of the fact that these kids have had a tremendous loss of learning over the past almost year now. Uh, so that's going to be something we want to take a look at. I mean, I'm hoping that the uh, vaccine is more widely available um, and we'll be able to get back to some semblance of normalcy this, this coming spring. But uh, I definitely like to provide these opportunities for our kids. Is there any talk from the state that it would be a statewide summer school? I mean, because everybody is suffering from this um, gap in their education. Yeah, I haven't heard anything to that effect, Bobby, at this point in time. Right now, you know, the DPH and the state continues to talk about schools being, the, well, specifically this, the governor talks about schools being the safest location around. And, you know, to an extent that's true, but when I've got an outbreak and I've got a, a case or multiple cases in a building, uh, students, parents, and staff might think otherwise. So, um, you know, I'd love to be able to offer up something and something, you know, that gives us a, a robust uh, learning environment for our kids and is supported by the state, that's icing on the cake. Because we are not the only district that's gonna be dealing with this. Okay. 
Great. Do we have a motion to adjourn if there's nothing else? So moved. Second. Perfect. Thank you, everyone. Okay, we'll see, see you, you soon. See you at seven. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks Lucy.